Tell your story. Change the conversation. Organized by students. TEDx Youth at SHC. Out of the nine other schools in our athletic league, I always looked forward to racing San Marin High School in cross country. Why? Because my friend Ben ran for their team. Since parting ways in elementary school and no longer going on family camping trips together, these cross country meets were pretty much the only time we got to see each other. But Ben never let me feel out of touch or like a stranger. When he'd see me, he'd yell, Grace, run up, give me a hug and ask how life was and he really cared about what I had to say. In this picture, <laughs> this slightly dysfunctional picture, uh, this was about five minutes before um, a Stinson Beach Relays, and Ben had to run up to me about five minutes before I was about to race. Although our conversation was brief, just him taking the time to come up and say hi to me made me feel so special that I couldn't help but smile during the race, even as my body screamed that there was nothing to smile about mid cross country race. <laughs> so when I got the news that Ben had passed away suddenly, I was devastated. My teammate Olivia and I were just walking into our hotel room for a basketball tournament four hours away from home. I threw my phone across the room, plunged my face into the bed, and started crying. Olivia got my two assistant coaches, and the three of them sat beside me, doing their best to console the inconsolable. They, I, eventually choking back tears, I felt the need to talk. Why was the world so cruel? Why in the hell do people say that everything happens for a reason? Why did I not stay closer to him? Well, he was here. They listened and shared their own experiences with grief, loss, and anger at the world. Talking to them and Olivia late into the morning gave me the strength to get out of bed the next day and made being away from my family and friends who knew him bearable. I was so grateful to them for being there for me, but it made me, but looking back, it made me beg the question, why did it have to be something as horrible as death? that brought us together in such a meaningful way, that made us talk in such a meaningful way. I realized that this wasn't a one-off. Many other meaningful conversations that I can remember have occurred after times like this, in the figurative or literal dark. We talk after something dark has happened, like a death, the loss of a job, a breakup, a illness, because these things shatter our normal routine. They make us stop and make us realize just how valuable and fleeting life and stability can be. We talk to both process these things and to figure out how we're supposed to move forward. At Ben's vigil, the pastor urged everyone to keep talking to one another. And most importantly, he encouraged people to go to Ben's family's house and drop in unannounced and say, you're staying for dinner. Because talking with one another is the only way we can realize that we are not alone going through the things we're going through. To see if others agreed with my theory that the darkness often inspires meaningful conversation, I surveyed faculty and students at my school. I asked the question, what time do you have the most meaningful conversation and experiences with people? And more than half of students and faculty responded that they had the most meaningful experiences and conversations at night or over dinner. And less than 1% said in the morning. <laughs> One person specifically wrote in, who wants to talk about the meaning of life if you haven't even woken up yet? <laughs> um, and so that made me think, why? What is it about the dark that is making these meaningful conversations and experiences happen? Could it be that there's just less stimuli and stuff to be distracted by and we're winding down kind of at night? Or could it just be that the darkness acts as a kind of cloak we can hide behind, making us less awkward and fearful of judgment? Whatever the reason, in my experiences, people, including myself, are more reflective, thoughtful, creative, brave, and vulnerable at night than during the day. They talk more deeply and share more deeply. 
but it is only dark nine to 14 hours of the day, and we have to sleep during some of that time too. So how can we bring this meaningful conversation out of the dark and have it more often? First, we need to expand the definition of meaningful conversation. Many people think of it as talking passionately about love, the universe, the self, and how we are all just specks, but also can do anything we set our minds to. I love these conversations, and these are the types of conversations that originally inspired this talk. I can't get enough of them. But meaningful conversation can also just be brief exchanges, amicable, amicable debates, talks about shared interests, or just simply a smile. You don't, you don't even have to open your mouth. It can just be a gesture, a twinkle of an eye, a nod of understanding, a listening ear. Just anything that is real, not forced or fake, and shows that you are trying to connect, if even in a small way, to the person or people you're with. My beloved middle school English teacher recently shared a quote with me by the great Argentinian poet Antonio Portia. The confession of one man humbles all. In AA, for example, when people get up and say, my name is blank and I'm an alcoholic, they are opening the doors for other people to feel comfortable to talk about their alcoholism as well. Talking about something, mental illness being a prime example, opens the door and chips away at the stigma and discomfort surrounding it. Ben was the master at meaningful conversation. He was because he was, he, did, he did two things. For one, he listened to the person that he was speaking to so fully that he made you feel like you, you were all that mattered in the world. He made you feel so important. And he was also unabashedly himself, opening the doors for others to feel vulnerable too. I'm not advocating that you be entirely vulnerable with everyone especially someone you haven't met or you, haven't, or you aren't very close with yet. But just because you can't nestle into someone's arms and talk about your deepest, darkest secrets doesn't mean that you have to resort to awkwardness or small talk about the weather. You can do simple things, just like asking someone how are you and really caring about their answer, or complimenting someone on a comment they made after class that struck you, or smiling at someone as you pass rather than pretending like you don't see them. Or deciding that today, I'm not gonna sit in silence on my bus, plane, or rideshare ride, and introducing yourself to the person sitting next to you or driving you. Just don't do this. <laughs> um, in fact, one of the longest, most memorable conversations I had was on a long plane ride in which I was like, you know what? I don't want to just sit here in silence the entire, entire ride. And so I decided to open my mouth and asked a benign question. Excuse me, is it okay if my bag's here? And to my delight, that opened the floodgates to what became one of the most memorable conversations I've had. You just never know when you might have a great conversation, and so the trick is to always be open and ready for one. Meaningful conversations are all, all they are are people speaking from the heart, sharing a piece of themselves. They are often spontaneous and uncensored, and that's what makes them so great. In the survey, people repeatedly responded to the question, what qualities characterize a good conversation with three things, honesty, engagement, and good listening. Yes, these things might come easier when it's dark out or when after something bad has happened, but it doesn't mean that we can't ramp up the levels of them in our everyday conversation. The biggest thing getting in the way of us doing this is, you guessed it, technology. When we're looking down at our phones, we can't possibly engage with the people around us, let alone even acknowledge their presence. And when we do look up, our attention span is shot, and so it's hard for us to actually like, stay with people and listen to them. In fact, in a UCLA study of sixth graders, 
um, comparing some who went to a tech-free camp compared to those who stayed in school with normal access to devices. Those that stayed in school with normal access to devices were poorer at reading their peers' emotions, which says that technology can make overall social success more difficult. Don't get me wrong, technology and social media have improved our lives in many ways. But they do decrease our chances of having meaningful face-to-face -face interaction with someone if for no other reason than our faces are so often down. So look up and look around. There are so many people out there living crazy, complex, beautiful lives, all with stories and opinions to share. You can find a friend in a stranger or a stranger in a friend. Be courageous. Even, no matter what, if you put effort into a conversation, you can gain perspective, advice, a funny story, or even a deeper relationship from it. Robert Waldinger, the, the Robert Waldinger, the director of the longest study on adult development at Harvard, said that their clearest message from their 75 plus years of the study was that good relationships make us healthier and happier. And good conversations are the bedrock of good relationships. So they are also fundamental in our health and happiness. So whether in the figurative or literal dark, let's continue to share everything that's going through our heads when we're perhaps more vulnerable and it comes easiest. But let's also really put our attention into bringing meaning to our everyday conversations with people by being more honest, engaged, and really listening. It's what Ben did, and it's why so many people loved him. And the great news, it's something we all can do too. So let's start the conversation. Thank you.